able to make it today. We are Instagram live streaming this event, and the video will also be available after the fact. So depending on how great the conversation goes, no, I'm just kidding, it'll be amazing. But after that, we will have the video available for those who would like to see it. So just so you know that's happening. Um, a few other notes of housekeeping. You need to use the restroom without this door to the left and around to the right, and then you'll have to kind of walk around and come back in the back. Sounds more complicated than it is, but feel free to do that at any time if you need. There's also refreshments outside and a water fountain out that door. Uh, we'll tap for a little bit here and then we'll open up for questions and have a little reception outside. So I just wanted to welcome everybody. Say, my name is Lexi. I'm the creator at One Archive at USC Libraries. Yeah. Really delighted to have this extraordinary panel with us this evening. I can't wait for the conversation. I think you know, we'll be having difficulty stopping it around 8 o'clock. Um, <laughs> since we're an intimate audience, we'll try to have as much of a conversation with questions throughout as we can manage. Um, we'll begin uh, by me saying a little bit about each of our panelists, just for those who don't know, although I think a lot of people here really know everyone up on stage. And then we'll have a short meeting to begin and then open it to a conversation that will really be based on the exhibition, uh, specifically Sarah Joy's exploration at the One Archives and in conversation with all these folks up here. Um, if those of you came on Saturday though or if read things online, but this has been a two plus year journey to get to this exhibition. So Sarah Joy and I have been talking since pre-pandemic uh, about this artist residency at one in converse, early conversations that centered in starting around the lesbian pulp collection at one archive, which of course is much smaller than the gay male pulp collection that we have, but no less significant. And really thinking about how we start there and branch out and really what Sarah Joy has been able to do in just a few short months, which is really remarkable is uh, explore the kind of Los Angeles lesbian literary scene from pulps to 60s, 70s, 80s, and thinking really about the contemporary moment, bringing our, some of that history back. We'll talk a lot today, hopefully, about what's in the vitrine here, which are all archival materials, either on loan from one of these ladies up here or one archives, and thinking through a lot about what that history means and what we can do with it now. So I think that's really the impetus for the panel and why we're here to be in conversation together to hear histories and also here um, here what it's been like uh, to have Sarah Joy come back and talk to each of you and what's come up and I think um, coming in the conversation as well I'll be asking what it's been like for each of you to be in this exhibition to be in conversation with Sarah Joy to bring up probably histories and memories that maybe you haven't thought about in a little while so we'll have all that coming up in just a moment but let me begin by just reading everyone's Biography as a way of introduction. We'll start with Sarah Joy. Sarah Joy Ford is an artist and postgraduate researcher at Manchester School of Art, where she's co director of the Queer Research Network, Manchester, and member of Proximity Collective. Ford works with textiles to explore the complexities and pleasures of queer communities, histories, and archives. Her practice sits at the intersection of digital and traditional using strategies of quilting digital embroidery, digital print, applique, and hand embellishment. Working with decorative textiles situates the practice within histories of gender and marginalization and a lineage of artists reclaiming cloth as a powerful language for disrupting discrimination, erasure, and heteropatriarchy. Her PhD research explores quilt making as an affective methodology for revisioning lesbian archival material. The loving attention and protective qualities of the quilt offer a reparative site for investing in lesbian archives inherently bound to a history of injury and marginalization. And then we'll go right. Born in San Francisco, California, Ann Bradley moved to Los Angeles in April 1972, attending Los Angeles City College and California State University, Los Angeles, receiving a BA in American Studies and MS in Community College Counseling. She was a counselor in job training programs from 1979 to 1983. In November of 1983, she went to work at, in a different life, Books, the nation's second gay and lesbian bookstore, founding the Lesbian Writers Series, which we talked about lots, in February 1984, and producing the first seven years of the monthly first ever showcase for lesbian authors in 1990. In 1987, she began a 20-year 
career as a publicist for agencies including the LA County Public Library, the LA County Office of Education, the ACLU of Southern California, and the Music Center of Los Angeles County. In 1991, she successfully lobbied to have gay and lesbian students and teachers included in LACOE's then 14 year, 14 year uh, old annual multicultural curriculum conference with the help of LA supervisor Edmund Kendelman and his openly gay staffer, Richard Lewis. At the July 2007 LA Gay and Lesbian Film Festival, she approached Dee Reese following the showing of her then short Pariah, asking to support the film, becoming the first producer for the 2011 universally acclaimed feature. In addition to her efforts to promote equality for all human beings, Bradley is a vegan and a passionate animal rights activist fighting for freedom and justice for all beings. Jenny Wren's work encompasses very, various disciplines from newspaper photographer, fine artist, small press publisher, and writer to the supporting wage job of public librarian. Some of her published work includes 22 lesbian erotic stories and published under the nom de plume Fiona Flander. Wren also published a poem here and there in the late 1980s. In 1991, she wrote and published A Dyke Repair, A Dyke's Bike Repair Handbook. Under the press, she co-founded with Carolyn Brothers, closed in Fever Press. That same year, her how-to article, The Art of Contography, appeared in Honor Bands. Uh, Ren's formal education includes a BA in philosophy, an MA, MA in art, and an MLS in library science. In 2013, she retired from library work to live and work in China for four years teaching art and English. She worked as an unpaid editor for Wikipedia while in China. She resides in Long Beach, with her wife, Dr. Karen Raphael, who's here, and their dog, Betty, who's here, and I got me. <laughs> and finally, last but certainly not least, Carolyn Weathers was born in Eastland, Texas, the daughter of a liberal Baptist minister. Her older sister, Brenda Weathers, was expelled from Texas Women's University in 1957 when she was 20 for homosexuality. Brenda was handcuffed in a police station but refused to repudiate her lesbianism. Brenda Weathers was to become a leading lesbian activist in Los Angeles in the 1970s. Having Brenda as a big sister and a supportive family was a huge benefit to Carolyn. Carolyn came out in 1961 in San Antonio, Texas, and in 1963, Weathers was the MC at a gay lesbian drag show held at a popular gay bar. Weathers moved to LA in 1968 and became a member of the Los Angeles Gay Liberation Front and the lesbian feminist at the Women's Center on Crenshaw. She marched in the first Pride Parade down Hollywood Boulevard in 1970. And in October of that same year, she was the first out lesbian on a Los Angeles talk show, the Regis Feldman Tempo Show. <laughs> and later that year, she also participated in the Biltmore Invasion, where protesters disrupted a presentation of the American Psychiatric Association's annual convention at the Biltmore Hotel of a film showing how to cure homosexuals and electric shock therapy. Yeah. <laughs> In 1984, she co-founded with artist Jenny Wren a lesbian book publishing company called Closed Pin Fever Press. They published 25 books and 55 authors. Their anthology of lesbian writers from Anne Bradley's Lesbian Writer Series was an award winner from the American Library Association. In 2015, she was one of three recipients of the annual Los Angeles Heritage Award given to those who have shown dedication and achievements to improving the quality of life of the LGBT community in Los Angeles. She is author of Leaving Texas, Crazy and Shakespeare's, and other Texas stories. Her stories and short memoir pieces have appeared in various anthologies, and her personal archival collection is how they want to have. I read all those by way to say there's so much to talk about, I don't know how we would possibly fit it in, but probably even in those just short bios, already you see the kind of interweavings of three of your lives over the past, what, 40 plus years, probably? as well as I think um, Sarah Joy, I'm excited to hear from you about what's been like to discover this in the archive and in the flesh. Obviously, I think on Saturday we talked a lot about how important it is not just to have the archival materials and the artist materials, but also the people here. So tonight is really special to bring those things together and I'm really looking forward to the conversation. So we asked to kick things off, we just do some short readings. We don't have a particular order and then we'll just have a conversation. Uh, so I don't know if Jenny or Carolyn you want to go first and read just a little bit. Maybe Carolyn, you should start because I've kind of started it off. Okay. 
And I have permission since I'm vaccinated to <laughs> shirt up the bus. You want to take your mask off while she reads yes. this reading. This is uh, Leaving Texas. This is the first book club to read the press conference. Jenny comes up and encompasses her art and uh, uh, photographs in it. And uh, my dedication was it's, it's Leaving Texas in the book club. Um, to my intrepid sister Brenda, with love and thanks to Jenny. 1946. The kitchen smells like pies baking. Mother smells like Jurgit's lotion and her long graceful hands knead the dough. She dusts the water of dough with flour and gives a piece to Brenda and me. She is warm, warm as the kitchen. Pray for another hour, she tells us, then I'll call you. Brenda and I slam the screen door as we run outside and blow in the warm green grass. Boots rose with us, barking, trying to catch us. We roll faster, spinning ourselves across the yard. Brenda flops onto her back, and the sun lights up her blue eyes, her pink cheeks. I flip over and feel light as air on my balsa wood glider. This feeling feels so good, I try to whistle it. Snaggle tooth, Brenda laughs at me, snaggle tooth. Mother, mother calls us in, pins bows in our hair. She is wearing her pretty black dress with big shoulders. <laughs> Where are we going, Mother? The Mahoney's little baby guy, she said, and we must go to the funeral. Mother's, Brenda's black patent leather shoes are squeaky and she hates them. I hate mine too. <laughs> if you slip on the bottom, you need to run good or get a good grip. The church is packed with flowers, lots of fruity white lilies, the smell of roses. Daddy is tall in the pulpit, but his deep voice is soft. I want to do everything right. Mother, is this right? I tug at her sleeve as we pass the casket. Am I walking past her right? Is this the way to look in? She nods quickly, taking time for me. The baby in the casket was only eight months old. I look in. The baby's eyes are closed. It's top knot very still. It pokes in the air like starch silk. The baby <coughs> Mahoney. Brenda is already out the door, her hands tearing at the sash around her waist, loosening it. Behind me come baby Mahoney's mother and daddy. Mrs. Mahoney's face scares me. It's so twisted up, her red mouth is like a gash. She reaches into the casket and picks up the dead baby. Mr. Mahoney grabs her arms and tries to put the dead baby back in the casket. They pull it. Mrs. Mahoney's eyes are big like a palm. Mrs. Mahoney cries, no, God, it's not fair. Bring him back, God, bring back my baby. I reach for Mother's hand. She holds mine tight. She and Daddy, both so handsome, look at each other and shake their heads a little. Mother and I leave as others swarm around the Mahoney's and try to get the baby back in the casket. Outside, the sun is warm. I kick off my shoes. Pink and white crepe myrtle blossoms bloom by the side of the parsonage, where we live across the street from the church, Hill Street Baptist Church here in Cleveland, Texas. Bees drone at the flowers. Overhead, there's a faraway sound of a plane. Somewhere in that blue, blue sky, those puffy white clouds. North of Henderson Street, 30 miles, is big Fort Worth and have folks. And Faye and Morgan, Cousin Sharon, and Grandmother Minnie. Brenda calls to me from that china berry tree. I look up and see her high in the cool, slick branches. It is my favorite climbing tree, more favorite even than the walnut in the front yard. I run in the house, change my dress for jeans, go barefoot to the china berry tree. Across the street, at the church, the hearse carrying the baby body of baby Mahoney begins a slow drive to the cemetery. And here's the last part. 1968. Brenda has moved to California where she's in college studying anthropology. She's working hard and likes it. She said, I fit in so much better there in Hollywood, in Venice. Caroline, she says, don't waste the way in Cowtown. In Venice, there's an apartment advertises for poets and dreamers. <laughs> so here I am on a hot August afternoon, wearing the love beads when you brought me from LA. Loving up my BW with my poetry and everything else I own, mostly books and records. Brenda and a headband is here to provide us the way her tomorrow and take over if my car breaks down. Everything is ready. Around me are the pecan trees, the crepe myrtle, just as they are also 40 miles away at church camp where preacher's daughters can still get triple bigger ice cream cones. Mother waits in the driveway. She lives and teaches school here now. Fort Worth is home to her. Her hair is silver. 
to give her a pound round. And she's as pretty as she was 22 years ago when I was six. And even the dogs were gay. We both had to think. Tears in our eyes. Honey suck all kinds of heavy and sweet around us. We hug hard. Her cheek is wet. Take care of my darling daughter. She says, I love you, mother. We break away. And I get in my car to give her in the house. Brenda bounces her tomorrow and starts to know. Brenda drives up the street. I back out of the driveway and move in behind her. I look back at Mother waving to me from the driveway. She will wait until she gets inside and cry. Thank God she has Minnie, Anna Faye, and Marvin. Even though she didn't get Mr. Wrights for her daughters and grandkids, all close and cozy on the suburbs next block over. I wave and wave and bite my lip to keep them bawling. The tears stream down my cheeks, into my mouth, and taste of salt. Now she was out of sight. I turned my eyes ahead to Brenda's car. We drive past the crossroads. Cleaver, 30 miles south, the sign says. It is hot. Sweat trickles down my collar, but I shiver and try to dump my beat out here that's too low in there to look fast. <laughs> Brenda's Camaro is just ahead. She leans out the window and flashes me a thumbs up her shabby haircut line. <laughs> we are leaving town now, turning due west. I pull the visor down. Excitement and adrenaline bust through me. We move onto the highway that heads to South Texas into the red sun.
by Jill Taylor came out. Jill Taylor was me. And the motorcycle in the pictures was my 1984 Honda Shadow, which I rode for eight years and did all the repairs, most of them. In Lesbian Line, the voice of our press, I continued the ruse of uh, my known bedroom as a separate and real other person. The article, the writer and the deadline, stated that the motorcycle repair guy scheduled for 1987 hadn't met the deadline. Jill Taylor, AKA Jen Wren, <laughs> did not finish the book in that year. Another year rolled by, no book. Finally, as stated in the Lesbian Line article, the publishers shipped Jill Taylor off to Maryland to live in the isolation of a campground to finish the book. <laughs> Actually, I was there because I had attended the 1989 American Bookseller Association Convention in Washington, D.C. Here is the account that I wrote for Lesbian Line. Many writers know what writer's block is, and publishers also know they're in trouble when one of their authors face the terror of that stone-faced impediment to the flow of language, the empty white paper. Finally, in 1989, we took Jill Taylor to a desolate campground in Maryland and left her inside a tent with enough canned food for two weeks. She was not to come out until the manuscript pages were filled with ink. She complied with no hard feelings us. She was willing to do whatever it took to crack the blog. That was the lesbian line version. I wrote a letter to Carolyn about the real deal. I'm camping now and it's delicious. It's like a desert island. The birds outside my tent are making a terrific racket. I love it. I'm reading. It's all I do besides cook on my propane stove, eat, then sleep, trips to the bathroom, provide exercise. I'm sleeping on a sleeping bag on the tent floor. I'm writing the motorcycle manual and reading novels. I have three days left. Then I go to Baltimore for another conference and more selling. And here is uh, a copy of Left in Line and a photograph of my <laughs>
absolutely beautiful short story, Tracking Down Vivian, which some of you may remember the LA Reader. It was uh, the other paper along with the LA Weekly, and they published this breathtaking story, and I said, I just, I just adore this. And so I sent it to all my friends. She knew that I was just a, 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 a fight for fan. She said, you know, I'm doing a reading in Newport Beach at this bookstore, women's bookstore, Three Guineas, that was launched by wonderful, wonderful Pam Roberts. And she says, I'd love you to come with me. It was a real, 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 real rainy night. And we get down there, and there's only about, as I described in the introduction, about 10 intrepid souls who've shown up. And we were absolutely wrapped. When she started reading, and we're just like, literally, I mean, we were absolutely, you could have heard a, a pin drop. And she said, well, I, I, she kind of looked at Pam, the store owner, like, well, I guess I, and Pam looks at Carolyn and says, read the whole thing. And it's a small chapbook, and it wasn't, this at the time, it hadn't been published, but it should, maybe, what would you, maybe 50 pages? 75. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I just read that. Right? Yeah. And, and we just sat there, and it was like, you know, and we all, of course, told Pam Roberts, thank you from the bottom of our hearts. And we're driving back, and we're coming to, I still remember it vividly, it's one of those very vivid memories where, there's a marsh area where you're coming off, I think, the 14 or something. It's not the 14, but some freeway onto the 405. And I said, we can't be the only people that hear this. This is this is just astounding. I'm gonna I'm gonna ask. I had I had gone to work at a different life books in uh, October of 1983, which was located in 4014 Santa Monica Boulevard, the absolute where it dead ends. Uh, on Sunset in Silver Lake. The, the, sadly, the, the building has been torn down. That's kind of too bad, but anyway, it was there. And I'd started work there, so this was the following, uh, that starting in October, and this is the following January. And I go in the store the next day, and I talk to wonderful John Ruggles and Richard Levante, and I said, you know, I've heard, my friend Carolyn is, is just an extraordinary gifted writer, and I'd love to start a writer series for lesbians. One of the things, I had been going to the women's building since 1976. Wonderful Sandy Kinney, who interested, P-I-N-N-E-Y, who actually with her partner Karma produced the uh, flyers. And you'll see one kind of in the middle there. She did a wonderful, she, uh, she, she printed them. They had a printing service. But anyway, um, I've been going to readings at the women's building and other readings for years. And women would never acknowledge their identity. You know, it was kind of like, well, this is kind of odd. You know, it was it was very closeted, and it's hard for young people to kind of understand that. But it was, you know, this is this is the '70s and the early '80s, and it was very closeted. So I wanted a series that threw out the closet, where if you come, you absolutely know. <coughs> and after that, I had absolutely no rules, mm -hmm. but if you wanted to read on the series, your name and your picture would be on the flyer. Mm -hmm. And uh, Carolyn, and, and, and she's so incredible, she, she actually has a tape of the first night, and it was uh, February 18th, 1984, the day before her birthday. Mm -hmm. So I actually got a big, huge tape, and we celebrated mm -hmm. her birthday after mm -hmm. the, the reading. Surprised you. But, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> It was an extraordinary experience. <coughs> she is extraordinarily gifted. And then wonderful Jenny, you know, and they come together and, and they I was just blown out of the water. They they published the first five years of the series. And it was like and that was I think February twenty fourth, ninety, I think, at the women's building. My, my the, the publication party was nineteen ninety at the women's building. Yeah, February twenty fourth, if I'm remembering. Okay. And the, the, Little Lights came out when? I think it was uh, 88 or 89. Yeah. The publication. Oh, right. 89. Yeah, it came out 89. Yeah, and I, I remember I stood up and I, cause they very graciously asked me to, to, to kind of open it. And I said, well, because there's this, it, the, the women's building is just so packed with lesbians. And I said, this is like the greatest prom night we 
<laughs> and it's a whole different scene now, you know. I mean, young it, people are out. I mean, well, as you and I kind of talked about, it's 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 a little dark right now. Actually, uh -huh. you know, uh -huh. I think that we all could agree that it's become rather bleak in this country, you know. But for a, a great many years, certainly uh, starting, I would say, in the nineties, things started to change very dramatically. But Carolyn. And I so I've been here a few days and I went for dinner with um 
Ella Van Hagai, who's the editor of the journal Lesbian Studies, because we'd met in Ireland. Um, we were giving a paper. We were giving papers on a panel about intergenerational solidarity. And actually, we hadn't really got a chance to. We, we spoke very quickly in the queue for the bathroom, and then like missed each other. But I realised that she was in LA, so I went to her house for dinner. And we were going out for a drive, and we bumped into Carolyn in the car park because <laughs> they lived together. She's like, "Oh, this is my friend Carolyn. She's an original gay liberation friend, and all this stuff." And then I was like, "Close to a few of And I was like, "I recognise that from the catalog." And we, yeah, we met really briefly, and then I went back and was looking at everything. And I was like, "Oh my goodness!" And I had already, yeah, got the clothespin books out, and it was just. A total kind of chance meeting in the car park, which is so bizarre. Yeah. Uh, so the, the car park is like somewhere on the map there. So we started off in Ireland and then went into the car park, and then and I just couldn't believe it. I'd already had like Jenny's stuff, and I'd been like, oh, what's this, what's this book? And and yeah, it was just amazing. It was just really, yeah, very very odd, and and that's that's kind of what this is. And this whole time of being here was being so much of these kind of wonderful and unexpected connections and you know that's really what it is doing it and I think it's yeah so yeah yeah no that story is, is so great obviously the, the meeting was meant to be and it speaks so much I feel like it's been interesting that so much of community has come up with the work that we've talked about and also here today and I think Sarah Joy and I are really focused on making this whole space a certain environment and hopefully when you walk in you get a certain feeling that it's a certain enclave space that we've worked hard in kind of every aesthetic choice to make um, which we're of obviously a much younger generation one that hasn't been privy to the kind of women's bookstores and lesbian writer series and things but I'm interested in maybe a kind of con conversation or reflections from each of you about what those kind of early women's bookstores or gay bookstores with a lesbian series um, or early lesbian presses, either the ones that you had to make or the ones that also came about like Nyad or something, what they meant that there were really those moments of community that we don't have in the same way now that maybe we're making through archive and community connections differently. Um, so we can reflect on kind of not having been a part of that history, but you know, Jenny, you talked about how in Lesbian Line we have it. In the vitrine here, the kind of list of women's books are that you can go to in places where you can find community or find like-minded individuals or things to read and how important that kind of reflection of one's own identity is both in literature or in print uh, or in works of art, but also in finding one another. So maybe a kind of question vis-a-vis -vis what Sarah Joy and I are imagining or only able to access through stories or through our kind of materials and what our attempt is as artists and curators to kind of make a space that feels like it reflects into that. But the question to you, one, does it do that, I guess? And two, you know, what's, if you can say in your own words what the experience of these earlier women's bookstores and presses that you made or similar ones you found. It was a wonderful, exhilarating time. And when Jane and I had closed the Hebrew Press, it was kind of the heyday of the Spawn Press Book Publishing Company. And the independent bookstore where there was gay or lesbian or quite a big use was. And we went bankrupt in the 90s when a lot did that too, in the age. Uh, but it was so exciting, but like, there were so many feminist uh, bookstores and uh, publishers. It was, we would go in, in our, as uh, publishers and as librarians, I was a librarian in the city of LA, Jenny was the county. We would go to these caucuses and conventions at the National Women's Studies Association. I remember one time I went to Spelman College in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And here, I just was going to read this week. Crossing Press, Mother Courage, Silk Press, Kitchen Table Press, Woman in the Moon, Spencer's Inc., Clayus, New Victoria, Allison Books, Firebrand Books, Nyad, Only Woman, Club and Fever Press. All these lesbian and feminist publishers would be there. This just swarm of electricity on the tables out on the floor. And then afterwards, after the convention was over, we all went to this place and partied together. Mm -hmm. It was excellent, partied and danced. <laughs> we had the sweet tea at the daytime and at the wine at night. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, a wonderful, exhilarating time um, to be doing this. Well, because also, we had very limited exposure to other lesbians aside from bars. You know, we, we yeah. were so hungry for, for lesbian culture and we had to kind of like make it, you know? I mean, it just wasn't there. But as we made it and as our press got going, mm -hmm. then we go to these places and suddenly there's there's all these women and they're all doing what we're doing, you know? Right, it was, it was, yeah. it was snowballing. 
started in bars. We've got this celebrity writers group. Uh, all these are happening at the same time. All these publishers, um, including us, the Lefty Writers Series, it was just a magnificent time that had so much to do to bring these lesbians together. Uh, it was just a And I would market. like to acknowledge that uh, I, I did the first seven years and then the wonderful Gail Suber, S-U-B-E-R, did a wonderful job mm -hmm. in uh, 1991. And then extraordinary Sophia Corleone, C-O-R-L-E-O-N-E, -E. she just was amazing brought all these incredible people. The last uh, night of the series, at, at a certain point, Sophia took it and made it independent, and it would, the series would take place at uh, uh, Plummer Park on Santa Monica Boulevard in West Hollywood. And uh, the last night of the series was November 14, 1998, mm -hmm. and it was Joan Nessel. Oh. Um, and that was mm -hmm. pretty. Joan Nessel is the yeah. founder of the Lesbian History Archives, and the mm -hmm. Credited with being one of the greatest writers in our community, and I had the great honor of bringing her to Los Angeles for the first time in January of uh, 1989, and she was here for an entire week. I exhausted her, bless her heart, but everybody wanted to see Joan, and uh, and uh, she was at UCLA because of Mary Margaret Smith, bless her heart. Who you might notice the Lambda uh, Delta Lambda, which was the 1988 first uh, lesbian sorority that was founded by uh, young lesbian uh, students at UCLA. And uh, there was a big story in the LA Reader about them. And they were kind of nonplussed. They didn't know what the big deal was. And I'm not being coy. They were like, well, like, OK, we, you know. And Mary Margaret Smith, who was like my age, and I'm going to be 69 in a month, she, um, she recognized, she was running the Center for the St Study of Women at uh, UCLA, the Women's Center. And she recognized they don't get how historic this is. They have founded a lesbian sorority, and they don't think it's a big deal. I mean, they were like, eh, but they were like, well, really, is it a big deal? And so she started, she launched this incredible series. And when I found out about it, I said, could Joan Nessel be on it? She goes, it's a great idea. But guess who I got to see? Audrey Lord. Um, you know, and Elizabeth Kennedy, and some, uh, I mean, it was, and Joan Nessel, and Joan was there, uh, again, it was January of 1989, but she, she was the last, and Sophia, I just, it sounds funny to say this, but I am a publicist, but I love how people, people kind of get the word out. There was no internet at this time right. in the 90s, right. so, there's no, you know, you're not like doing this, you know, right? <laughs> your thumbs were free, you know? <laughs> but, Sophia Corleone got these incredible uh, postcards, and I think one has an entire collection of them, probably, and maybe even the, the Mazer. But she'd have, she'd have, I always did it with two women on, on the, the series, except the first night with Carolyn was her, right? she was alone. But, <laughs> namaste. <laughs> but, um, so she, she'd have these wonderful postcards, and I also used to joke that we wanted the flyer that was produced, we wanted it to be on every lesbian uh, refrigerator in <laughs> California. Because <laughs> again, you weren't like going online to see this. It was all, you know, tactile, anyway. <laughs> yeah, we would have uh, so long, we were 5529 on Figueroa in Howard Park. Yeah. It, was a, it was the top floor in the business area of Nate was on. Chinese. Chinese with super pop, pop sour soup. It was shot by a woman named Inez. She sold magical figures, uh, spell books, and the odd to the toothpaste. There was a, a, a karate place that this 100 pound woman with a black belt gave her children. And the, the sound of the fur, right? And there would be a, there was a Masonic Hall at the end, and every Saturday night they had a big blast. And I remember one of our salons, we all went out in the hall and woo woo, that salon. <laughs> and one time, uh, one of our salons, Joan Nessel came to read. And we just had wonderful times like that. Um, it was the togetherness. Um, one time, we decided to show the 1922 silent movie, Salome, uh, based on Oscar Wilde's play. Was, I can't get it time, though. <laughs> <laughs> With all 
Lord knows who mom though, a lesbian. She was uh, Nancy Reagan's godmother. Wow. Uh, Nancy Reagan's mother was best friends with a lesbian, All I Knows Mother. So All I Knows Mother did this film, and she was Solomon. And all the bit parts were played by her gay and lesbian friends. And it's marvelous and campy. So <laughs> campy. Well, it's before you could just go to, go to video or this. Or this. <laughs> so I went to this place, and I bought, it, I bought that film in a can. Find it after. Oh, no. There's an incredible picture that was taken. 
she was publishing, and she had and it, 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 she had so many different colors. Uh, and I, I was on the phone with her once, and I said, I just thank you so much. And she goes, What are you talking about? You're giving my girls, you know, a, a, a place to. And I said, Yeah, but I said I just love you, you know. You're saying, so there were a lot of really, really wonderful. Elvis Klein Healy, Namaste, Namaste, Namaste. It was kind of like the godmother of our of Los Angeles lesbian, you know, poets and writers community. And Terry Wolverton. And just, just you know, a, a lot of people, and I'm, I'm probably forgetting to name everybody, but it, I think I, I bring it back to the, the wisdom of Solomon when he said, go and talk to the communities. See, who, you know, how things, and, and I, I would go to, there was a great little coffee shop called The Go Between, and I would sit there with people at the grill. It's where we would go after the series on those Saturday nights and hang out. It was really fun. The readings were phenomenal, but it was also fun afterwards. You know, mm -hmm. as uh, you know, as Jenny said so articulately, it was, and also Carolyn, it was like a place for lesbians to meet. I, I, I'll just end with this, and it was kind of sweet. I had people run up to me and say, "I met my girlfriend at the lesbian writing series." <laughs>
which, and there is a story in Les Lesbian Line about it as well, and I heard it from both of you, and I saw what you wrote at the time, so it's like really fun hearing like three different versions <laughs> about how this artwork of Jenny's was the inspiration for the, for the press and calling it Close Pin Press, um, which is what, yeah, I got really excited in as well, and you can kind of see the close pins on the wallpaper. Um, and of course, we were talking about the, um, the cover of Jenny's illustration for the cover of Lesbian Line. So the title for this show is a kind of a homage to Jenny's original cover for Lesbian Line. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I wanted to ask Jenny about the close pins bit, um, but I also wanted to kind of, yeah, because we're touching on the title about looking for lesbians um, and having this discussion about different kind of social spaces. I think that's what, like, the thread that draws everything together is that, and like we say, it's not just about materials, it's not just about books, it's about connections and relationship and, and using books as a way to find them. And that's why it started with the pulp novel. It was this interest in, like, when there was so little kind of lesbian kind of culture and community, that that was like the first sort of door for people and like um, Mary Jane Meeker and Anne Bannon like speaking to each other. The, it's not just about the book, it's about seeing that there's someone else like you in that book or that event being a gateway to having kind of connection and community with real people. Like it means it's so much more than just the books or the, you know, it's about connection. And I was interested in how I'm always looking for lesbians in the archive, <laughs> and that's what I kind of I was really excited when I saw Lesbian Line because it wasn't just about the books that you were publishing. You had this list. You were trying. You were doing this and being at these conferences and being at the writer series because, you, like, that's where you can find lesbians and build community. And you were trying to share that with other people by kind of making those lists and reaching out. And it not just being about what you're doing. It's about this huge kind of network where people could find each other and like not not feel yeah. alone. I was kind of pissed, you know, that you go to bookstores and there were no lesbian books. And you know, what's wrong with this? Ah, you know, I just get mad about it. And I also wanted to be able to walk into a drugstore on Valentine's Day and get a card for a lesbian. <laughs> Actually, now it's kind of coming around to that. I can't believe it. Or, you know, I mean, it's just no way you would ever see a Valentine card for the lesbian. Yeah. I think that's the thing, isn't it? That that's like, all, you know, a bit of what connects it. Because it's, if you see the thing that you, you know, I've always been like, oh, why is it, you know, wanting more like visual kind of lesbian visual arts? I'm like, well, I'll just make it. Do we want to write a series? We'll make it. Do we need more books? We'll make a press. And that, that's what I love about like doing lesbian history work and like seeing yes. that. Because that's the, that's the spirit of it. Mm -hmm. That's why in lesbian line, Jenny always included uh, what was going on in the women's and, and the lesbian and feminist poetry world. Mm -hmm. It was our catalog, but it was also, it's a, it's a time capsule, really, to what these lesbian lines. And why she always included where to find lesbian conservation. That kind of network that made it be known and to, to weave together what was happening in the community around the world. Just have that information. There's yeah. so many uh, publications, yeah. Lesbian Line and some of the others, but just have that. Where do you go? Where do you find things? What do you read? Lesbian Line, on our, we got to our roof, uh, to the kitchen window. And on the roof, sometimes we would put our book cover hanging on the clothesline. Oh, so that's one of the Lesbian Line. It's oh. based on our uh, And I think there's, 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 there's a picture, picture of that. There's a picture of that. There's a picture of that. There's a picture of that. Before we wrap up, I don't know if there's any questions from the audience that you're burning or dying to ask. Yes, please. Question. One little tiny thing jumped out at me. Archive is queer hair salon. What's the story behind that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, what? A queer hair salon. Well, queer hair salon. I have a lot of hair, <laughs> hair upkeep to do. I have an undercut which needs maintaining, and I didn't have my partner with me until yesterday. So I have to buy some hair clippers, and we have a uh, we. <laughs> Lexi has a wonderful intern called uh, called Ren, uh, who's a Getty intern, who's amazing and did so much work on helping with this exhibition. 
brilliant, they're absolutely fantastic, and one of their duties included shaving my head. <laughs> but uh, keeping, yeah, keeping my undercut maintained, and uh, that was part of their intern duties. <laughs> so, and we were doing that at the archive. And also outside here, I also shaved their head, so there was a lot of head shaving. <laughs> and that's what that is.